Today I'm joined by the author of Mad on Radium, lovely Rebecca Priestley, uh, New Zealand in the Atomic Age. And Rebecca is a science historian, associate professor at Victoria University and author of the recently published 15 Million Years in Antarctica. Uh, Mad on Radium depicts an alternative history of Aotearoa's involvement in the nuclear age and it greatly informed our research on the exhibition A Way Through. Um, I've been looking forward to picking your brains, Rebecca, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, kia ora, thank you. So I've been wondering, how did the idea for this book come about? Well, it was back, oh, more than 20 years ago, I think. I'd, I'd um, Early on, I did a geology degree at Victoria, and um, one of the jobs I got when I was a recent graduate after my honours degree was working at the Institute for Geological and Nuclear Sciences, um, doing some communications work for them. And I got the job because of my geology background. And I found out that they also had a nuclear sciences side to their research. And this was completely new to me. I had no idea about this because I was really familiar with New Zealand's nuclear free narrative. So I'd grown up um, going on protest marches, protesting uh, against nuclear, American nuclear warships coming into the harbour and protesting against the French nuclear testing in the Pacific. Um, so to find out that we had had since the 1950s an Institute for Nuclear Sciences um, was really interesting. So there was this place up on the hill in Gracefield um, where scientists did research into nuclear science and there were uh, particle accelerators there and there had mm. been plans for a nuclear reactor there that never eventuated but I just thought this was really really interesting and yeah, I yeah. wanted to investigate and find out more so when I was looking for a PhD topic um, I, I had this idea of researching New Zealand's nuclear and radiation history and so the story turned out to be much bigger than I had even imagined then so I did a PhD I took a very long time I was having children and doing things at the same time as studying part-time. And then um, probably a couple of years after I completed the PhD, I'd turned it into a book um, that was published by Auckland University Press. So it was, it was a long time coming. Yeah, so um, what was it like doing a literature review when you first stuck into the topic? Did you find that there was a real lack of historic narrative that was, you know, opposite of what you were used to, um, this well, anti-nuclear narrative? Well, th there was a strong anti-nuclear narrative and that this, what, this story was not wrong or erroneous mm -hmm. in any way. It was just really a strong part of our narrative and it had become a really embedded part of our culture um, after the 1986 decision to be nuclear free. Um, mm -hmm. But I did find there were other things published as well. There was an account of the... Um, history of the National Radiation Laboratory by uh, um, a scientist called Andrew McEwen who had led the laboratory and there were a lot of published um, journal articles and so on but this this knowledge was mainly held within the the science community it, there was nothing um, popular or mainstream that had been written right. and I think the whole um, the history community hadn't really tackled this topic either but there were some things I found that just really hadn't been covered at all. And one of those things was um, the uranium prospecting on the west coast of the South Island in the 1950s. There was a bit of a uranium boom, which was all very exciting. So that was yeah. great fun to explore these topics and, yeah, really get, get lost and immersed in them. Yeah, there's so many things that are just so surprising that you come across in this book mm -hmm. that I never would have known. And I, I studied a whole chunk of this history in NCEA. Um, ah, right. In history, we studied the anti-nuclear campaigns mm -hmm. and um, the full, I think about three decades worth of the lead up to them, um, the sort of momentum that was built. But yeah, there's so many aspects of New Zealand's involvement that I was just completely unaware of. Right. Um, so I discovered this book through, um, oh, sorry, I discovered through your book that McCann's anti-nuclear stance would have still been relatively uncommon in the 1960s. Um, specifically in Aotearoa, um, around the time that he began his gate series of paintings. Something that complicated this investigation, however, was the confusion of nuclear energy as an electricity source with nu nuclear weapons development. Mm 
Um, was it possible to separate these emerging scientific fields around the 1950s and 60s? Yeah, that's really interesting question because um, when nuclear energy first became possible or, or commercialised nuclear energy like in the 1950s um, at Calder Hall in the UK, they started um, providing electricity to the national grid, the electricity mm. grid, um, through production of nuclear energy. And this was really, um, there was a lot of propaganda around it as, you know, isn't this wonderful, this sort of, um, you know, this brilliant new means of um, generating electricity that will be so beneficial across society. And there was really high hopes across the Western world and, and in Russia as well for the, the sort of transformational change that would be possible through nuclear power. Um, and nuclear weapons were kind of a separate thing. Um, but what was not well known at the time was that these um, nuclear power stations were also involved in the production of the raw materials for nuclear weapons. And mm. so originally in New Zealand, there was support for the, um, the British effort to develop nuclear weapons. So in the 1950s, the UK was testing um, their weapons in the Pacific, and there was uh, support from New Zealand for this. But after that, through, you know, when once the British stopped testing, the New Zealand support for nuclear weapons development seemed to fade away. And after that, um, it became more common for um, people to oppose nuclear weapon production and the campaign for nuclear disarmament that both the McCann brothers were involved in, um, took off. But this was separate from the, the issue of nuclear power. So nuclear power was proposed for New Zealand in, seriously in the 1960s, and there'd been an expectation of it from the 1950s. So the two things were quite separate, and it was possible and common to be very supportive of the idea of nuclear electricity, what, while also being uh, against nuclear weapons development. Right. Yeah, so that, that was something that I had some trouble discerning while I was doing my research, um, just learning about different campaigns and the, the name, I mean, campaign for nuclear disarmament is quite clear because it separates the two, mm -hmm. but there can be a bit of confusion there. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it would have been possible for the New Zealand government to have protested nuclear weapons, um, say as early as 19, the 1940s after the World, Second World War, um, yet still develop nuclear science as a potential source of electricity? Or do you think there was um, perhaps too much of a conflation in those early days? No, I, I, I think it was possible. In, in the um, 1970s, in 1973, New Zealand sent a frigate to Mororoa to protest against the French testing there. At the same time, we were um, planning on developing um, mm. nuclear power. So they were very much separated there. Nuclear power was a good thing. Yeah. And nuclear weapons was increasingly seen as a bad thing. And I think it's just um, more recent generations since New Zealand became nuclear free that everything nuclear has been bundled together right. as yeah. bad. So, I, you know, I think, I think New Zealand did have those things separated out until, um, you know, probably until the late 70s and 1980s. Yeah. So I, I sort of, I guess I've been having to unpack what I've learned where I sort of complain all oh, nuclear things is yeah. bad. And um, I, I mean, more recently, people, there's been a lot of discussion with nuclear energy becoming a, um, an alternative to our current energy sources. So that has sort of started my rethinking of the subject. But um, then when you learn about the, the way that the nuclear power uh, stations and research centers were actually contributing towards the weapons development, um, particularly in the US when there's the rhetoric around atoms for peace, um, yeah. which is more or less double speak because <laughs> it was really not, not quite what it seemed. Um, mm. I think that's, that's definitely where some of the confusion comes in. And I, yeah, I, I'm glad to clear that up. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really common and especially um, for well, younger people um, who've maybe, you know, went through school after New Zealand became nuclear-free or after the nuclear-free legislation came in just to 
think of nuclear free as being all encompassing. Mm, and yeah. we even, even, I mean, not just young people. When I was doing the research, I had um, people contact me um, with the sort of scoop that, you know, did you know that in lower heart there is a nuclear, mm. there is a particle accelerator in nuclear free New Zealand? Or um, did you know that nuclear materials are being imported into New Zealand? And the thing is, the particle accelerator is used um, for research and for um, radiocarbon dating. And the nuclear materials being brought into New Zealand are used in medicine, you know, to help cure people from cancer. Mm. So that did seem to become this narrative that anything associated with nuclear and radiation was was a bad thing. I suppose it, you can you can understand the scepticism though when it when something is. Um, Termed as being for research, though, because in the past it has it has been, um, I suppose, research has been used as a veil for mm. more sinister things. So um, sure. maybe that's where that scepticism comes in. Um, it also turns out that Jim McCann, Colin's brother and a physicist involved in nuclear science in Aotearoa, seems to have been a key informant in Mad on Radium. Yeah. It must have been a fascinating interview subject because he doesn't fit easily on one side of the history or the other. Um, for those who don't know, he was both part of the nuclear project and a member for a member of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, was he an in, was he an enthusiastic interviewee? I wonder. Oh, he was really great. He um, so I interviewed him in person, but I also he had a lot of um, written material. He had diaries. Um, uh, like from his trip to Morira on the frigates, mm. and he had given um, talks to local probus groups, I think, and about his work. So he he had a lot of information. He was really keen to share it, um, and he was also really um, interested to separate out these, you know, the misconceptions. So right. he was keen to talk. So he he was really interesting, and he's one of the people that I followed right throughout the book because he kept on turning up at different points in the story. So d just you know to give a bit of an overview, he was as a young um, physics grad, he was involved in the search for uranium during the war. He was seconded during the war. Um, um, there were a lot of scientists who were put to work in various projects rather than being sent overseas. So he um, was involved in searching for uranium around some South Island locations using a Geiger counter that he'd made in the laboratory. And a Geiger counter was just a very new thing um, that could be used to test for radiation. Um, he was also involved in a, a post-war survey, a bigger survey um, right around the South Island looking for uranium. Uh, he was also involved in investigating the production of heavy water um, from the uh, geothermal fields at Wairaki, um, and this was something that could be used in nuclear reactors um, for research. Um, um, also, though it wasn't sort of talked about at the time, use in uh, nuclear weapons. And then he worked, he was seconded for a couple of years to the Atomic Energy Research Establishment in Harwell in the UK, 1948 to 50. He spent some time at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, and then he worked at the Dominion X-ray and Radiation Laboratory, which became the National Radiation Laboratory. But his focus during all this time was safety. Mm. So he was involved in um, sort of monitoring radiation levels um, and uh, reactor safety and things like that. Um, and then, so it was in 1973 when he went on the frigate to Mororoa, he, he was monitoring radiation levels. So I don't see what he was doing there as in any way in conflict with his um, opposition to nuclear weapons through CND. Um, yeah, he was very, you know, his, his involvement, he wasn't developing um, new te nuclear technologies. He was very much involved in monitoring the impact of radiation levels on um, people who worked in those fields or on the wider population. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, initially, um, it seemed like quite an irony because in the, in the art historical side of things, you don't hear a lot about Jim McCann when you're researching. Mm -hmm. um, well, when, anyway, when I was researching um, his brother's nuclear interests and um, there was just one little note in a file, um, a file on Colin McCann with, it was, sort of like a clue that someone had left and it was um, an anonymous note and it was typewritten and it just said that 
Jim McCann had um, been involved in the nuclear project. So uh, as a nuclear physicist, and it was sort of like a, yeah, like a tip off sort of like, this might be why his brother was so anti-nuclear. So that, that's sort of where I built a bit of a idea of who Jim McCann might have been. And um, interesting. Yeah, started to pursue that track a little bit more, and then it turns out there is this history that's mm-hmm. recorded on his his involvement. Um, I wonder if he was actually much of a. Did he mention having pacifist views at the time that he was um, working in the time of war? Because Colin was um, a conscientious objector. I think he was working in the tobacco fields, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, it's sort of ironic because it, I guess working doing the uranium searching um, could have actually been a way of staying out of war, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even though you can think of it as contributing ultimately to yeah. weapons development in a really indirect way. Right. So was, was Jim older than, uh, sorry, was Colin older, the older brother? I should know that, but I don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. They were around <laughs> the same age, I think. Okay. So... Yeah, I don't recall talk, talking about it, but I, I, what, what you said about um, scientists is true. So uh, there was a man, manpower committee of the DSIR that was responsible for um, um, directing scientists into areas of use to the war effort. So I certainly don't remember Jim saying he'd rather be <laughs> in, in Europe or the Pacific fighting yeah, the war. Course. Yeah, I think for a scientist... Um, being able to tr- travel around the South Island, you know, tramping up and down beaches and, and going into the fjords in a boat with a Geiger counter would have been a pretty great way to spend the war. Pretty preferable, definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, some nuclear physicists actually changed career path after the shock of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm-hmm. um, which were, of course, the first public weaponizations of nuclear science yet. Yeah. Jim McCann decided to stay in the field. Um, would it be fair to suggest, actually, I think, <laughs> I think we should probably scrap this question because we've sort of already answered it. Um, I'll ask this question instead. Uh, do you think personally that it would have been too idealist, idealistic to abandon atomic science given the aggressive manner in which world powers were developing weapons in the Cold War? But then Jim, Jim wasn't involved in nuclear weapons no, uh, in any way, and even when he was involved in the uranium survey, he didn't really know what it was about. And so, when the um, news about Hiroshima emerged, that was a complete shock to him. At that time, most people had no idea that there was any possibility that um, that these radioactive um, materials could be used for a bomb. Mm production that was complete um it was an absolute secret and the person who had organized the survey Ernest Marsden head of the DSIR he knew about it but the people doing the survey didn't necessarily know what was going on so that was a complete shock to him Mm. um so his involvement after that um you know again his involvement um looking for heavy water at Wairaki it was you know on the surface, it was about electricity production again. And then when he was at Harwell and at Oak Ridge, again, it was about electricity and about reactor safety. So I think he was very, very separate in the work that he was doing from nuclear weapons. And New Zealand never had anything to do with nuclear weapons development, Mm. um, apart from the couple of scientists who were seconded to the Manhattan Project during the war. Okay. Yeah, and and the support that we gave to the British while they were doing their weapons testing in the Pacific. Mm, um, of course. Yeah, but but Which McCann is, wasn't involved in that. Yeah, and of course it's more of a diplomatic, or a yeah. sort of a tokenistic contribution as well. Yeah. Well, we offered the practical support we offered was around um, weather forecasting and so mm. on. Yeah. But yeah. Th- those were the days when you know we were much more closely connected with the UK. And um, if they asked us to do something, usually we'd say yes. Though we did say no when they asked to test um, their hydrogen bombs in the Kermadec Islands, which are mm, um, yeah, that's right. 
part of New Zealand territory. And I think it was quite significant that New Zealand at the time said no to that request. Mm. Okay. But yeah, um, McCann, McCann's involvement was very much around, you know, radiation safety and protection, which is a very yeah. different um, field from weapons development. Okay, it's good to clear that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, sometimes people think about good nuclear and bad nuclear. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'll move on then. <laughs> In a conversation with the exhibition's co-curator, Sophie Thorne, Colin McCann's daughter, Victoria, spoke of a time when her uncle Jim came back from his work overseas and the brothers would pour over images that Jim had brought back. Thanks to your book, we can assume that these images would have been of either the laboratory in Britain or perhaps nuclear tests in the Pacific, some of which Jim, as you've just mentioned, uh, witnessed firsthand through his line of work. Was sending personnel to monitor and observe these tests actually beneficial to New Zealand at all? I think it was really important. It was really important symbolic move, I guess. So there was a, um, a flotilla of yachts who was going up to Mororo to protest, and um, New Zealand made the decision to send uh, two frigates, the Otago and the Canterbury, to protest. So it's kind of a symbolic thing. Um, mm -hmm but really significant for a government, at a, you know, the protest to be mounted at that government level rather than it just being a bunch of individuals. Um, and I think there was, you know, wide support for it and it, you know, we made some pretty amazing news reports. Um, so there were a bunch of uh, uh, journalists who were on board as well and Jim McCann was there as um, a radiation safety officer. So he was measuring radiation level in the air mm. and um, you know people on board had radiation dose meters to measure the amount of radiation they were getting yeah, yeah so it was it was kind of bearing witness to what was going on mm. and registering their process protest so I think it was an important thing for New Zealand to do at that time yeah okay um, you also mentioned that Aotearoa would have gone nuclear had it been economically and politically expedient which of course is the great irony of the off-repeater claim that Aotearoa is categorically a nuclear-free nation. Yeah. Um, do you find the contemporary leveraging of our anti-nuclear position frustrating given your historical findings? Um, I find it really interesting. I mean, it was really, in terms of um, doing research for a thesis and for a book, it was really interesting. It was really great to be able to find out something that was a bit different, to provide an alternative narrative. So it wasn't really frustrating. It was kind of exciting just to make this discovery. And I mean, it, it's not like I uncovered anything that was a secret. Right. It was just um, putting together the pieces in a slightly different way to find a different narrative. And that narrative was that um, we were considering nuclear power, um, mostly to meet Auckland's growing um, energy demands from a growing population from the 19. 60s um, and we'd been thinking about it there was an expectation that we were going to move there since the 50s but it was in the 1960s I think 1964 that it first went on the New Zealand um, electricity plan for the future um, and it stayed there for a few years until it came to the point that we had to actually make a decision because of the lead time required in building a nuclear power station um, and everything had to be um, sort of costed out, what, where the site would be, what, um, what they called manpower requirements at the time. So a site was chosen on the Kaipara Harbour um, and um, people were sent to the UK to train. Um, and then it was a matter of sort of costing it out. Um, and um, towards the late 70s, there was a Royal Commission of Inquiry into nuclear power generation in New Zealand. Um, sort of, you know, to make this decision about whether whether or not we're going to go ahead with this. But at about at the same time, um, the Maui gas field was, um, or the extent of the Maui gas field was discovered. So there was this really relatively cheap and accessible source of power there. And also the Huntley um, coal deposits were sort of re-quantified. And so there was another pretty accessible source of power there. So with this newly assessed coal and natural gas um, options, nuclear power just wasn't an e economically viable mm. consideration. So, um, with gas, so with gas and coal being um, what you call indigenous 
energy sources, does that mean that uh, if we had built a nuclear power plant, we would have had to import all of the materials to actually generate energy from it? Um, yeah, possibly. The, 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 there were uranium deposits on the west coast of the South Island, but mm. um, every time they were assessed, um, that it was not quite economic to actually try and extract them. Mm. Um, but it was more the cost of building a nuclear, you know, a nuclear power station is, an, a, you know, a very complex and, um, you know, by necessity, it has to be pretty, pretty, um, mm. <laughs> pretty thoroughly, carefully built and so on. Yeah. So it's just a, it's actually a very expensive electricity generation option. Right. And if you sort of weighed up the cost and, and not to mention the necessity to train up a whole new people, a whole new industry that New Zealand had no experience with versus natural gas and coal, which were pretty straightforward in comparison. So just from an economic standpoint, it just did not, it just didn't hold up. But yeah. meanwhile, the Royal Commission of Inquiry went ahead anyway. And, um, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of opposition to nuclear power. Um, there were some people in support of it as well, um, but it didn't really have to get put to the test because economically we'd already decided that we didn't need it. So the Royal Commission ended up um, um, concluding that it wasn't needed for now, but that it, you know, it should be reassessed, I think at about 2000, but I, I can't quite remember exactly. But you know, by which point we've sort of completely changed and I think yeah. the you know, the whole nation has a different attitude to things nuclear. Do you think it would get more opposition now than it than it had? I think now it's a different issue um, because um, with climate change being caused by fossil fuels, you know, all that coal that we were burning and the natural gas that we were burning is actually pumping carbon into the atmosphere. So perhaps, you know, you'd have an argument, well, maybe nuclear is better than that. but um, you know, the flip side, of course, is that we're actually really, really good at generating electricity from renewable sources in New Zealand. So I don't think there'd be much support, though. Um, I did actually look into this um, and some other research um, around the time of uh, Fukushima. And there's about 30% support in New Zealand for nuclear power as an electricity source, or there was at the time. Mm, I mean, even, I was... even after Fukushima. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about Fukushima today and how um, one of the reasons often cited is um, why, why nuclear power wouldn't be popular here is because we're such a small landmass and so any accident would just wreak absolute havoc on the population, um, supposedly. I guess that's sort of the, the popular opinion. Um, but then when you think of Japan, it's also quite a narrow landmass comparatively, and they've, they've also explored nuclear power. So, mm. um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to make those comparisons. Yeah, but they've got a much bigger population than us. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we just don't need it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a story of nuclear legacy waste stored in the Marshall Islands under a leaking concrete repository called the Runet Dome. And a massive spill is anticipated as sea levels rise and extreme weather events increase due to, due to climate change. Is this the sort of thing we would have seen more had we gone nuclear powered in the late 20th century as we had planned at the time before hitting the Maui gas field? Um, I think any, if New Zealand had adopted nuclear power at the time, it would have been one nuclear power plant. And mm. I think um, any waste that was generated would be pretty minimal compared to the sort of waste generated by the American nuclear weapons program. Um, so, you know, I don't imagine New Zealand would have made a huge contribution there, but I just think this sort of issue is really interesting. So we've got rising sea levels, which is happening because of climate change. And, and um, you know, there's a possibility or we're sort of tracking towards a meter or so of sea level rise by 2100. And, and this is happening because of our burning of fossil fuels, but it's then going to impact on some nuclear waste, um, you know, that is poorly stored. So this is kind of, you know, it's all sort of complex and interesting because one of the things that some people say that we could adopt 
um, mm. to try and reduce our carbon emissions is nuclear power. Yeah. And this, this is not a sensible thing for New Zealand at all because we um, generate most of our electricity through um, renewable means and we're on track to soon being 100% renewable. But other countries like China and the United States are still generating a lot of electricity from fossil fuels, from coal. Mm. Um, is that because they have less indigenous renewable sources? Well, you know, it is, they, are, they might be burning their own coal, though Australia exports a lot of coal. Um, Oh, I think there's all sorts of complicated reasons yeah. because in some ways it's cheaper. Mm. Um, um, there just hasn't been the investment in um, renewable energies because fossil fuels are so heavily subsidised that it's um, it's kind of led to a continuation of that sort of industry. But hopefully, all those things are changing. Mm. Um, um, sure. but there, you know, there are. While I'd say renewables are one hundred percent the thing that we should be going towards. Um, and I think there's massive untapped potential for solar energy. Um, there are now nuclear electricity generation options like thorium reactors that generate a lot less waste than the old style nuclear reactors. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not advocating them, but I'm just saying. Um, it's good yeah. to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are other options out there. <laughs> yeah. And of course, it's the weapons production that, that is producing the, you know, the hideous waste. Yeah. Mm, okay. So that, yeah, that's a, another distinction I wasn't aware of. Um, I mean, I thought all radioactive waste was radioactive waste. I didn't realize there was much of a difference. Um, no, between there's, the two. Yeah, there's a big difference. And New Zealand produces some low level radioactive waste from, um, from uh, medical use of radioisotopes mm. um, and different levels of radioactive wastes have different um, amounts of toxicity and also different half-lives um, about how long they're going to be mm. dangerous and need to be stored for. So the, yeah, there is a huge, huge difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, so McCann repeatedly painted the Kaipara Harbour in the early 70s around the time that he, at, that its coast was um, openly being considered as a potential nuclear power station site, as you mentioned. He explicitly suggested that one of these compositions titled Mondrian's Chrysanthemum of 1908 could be read as a nuclear explosion off the West Coast. Your book notes how the now cancelled plan for our first nuclear power station was intended for the Kaipara because warm water byproducts could conveniently be discharged into its harbour, um, amongst other factors. A plan, this was a plan that experts noted at the time would create toxic algal blooms like the ones we're seeing now in our fresh water systems. Also, little thought was given to the disposal of radioactive waste, um, which at the time was an unsolved problem that would, the plan was it would have just been shipped to other countries to deal with. Um, I was surprised to find that the management of radioactive waste today is still shockingly poor in places like the US. Um, do you think a hardline environmentalist like Colin McCann would promote nuclear energy today if he were alive as a more clean energy source that could mitigate climate change? Yeah, that's it's, interesting. I don't know, not for New Zealand, but perhaps, you know, perhaps for some other countries, um, like I mentioned, Australia and the US. And some people really have changed their mind about nuclear um, energy for, for that very reason. We need to do something about um, our warming planet and climate change mm. and we need to do it really quickly so um it is an option um and and perhaps he he would support that but there's also so many other things that we can do and so many other paths that we could take um the, you know even if you were to say we, we've got to sort of do a rapid uptake of nuclear um energy the amount of money that would be required to put into that. Why not use it for solar power or more mm. distributed electricity um, systems and renewable options? Yeah, you know, there, there's so much we could do if we really put the kind of money in um, that that some of these other options might um, attract. Yeah, yeah. I realise your answer to the previous question sort of <laughs> sure. undercut that one a little bit. <laughs> um, Lastly, I'd like to ask, um, I imagine it would have been rather difficult to work with data as qualitative as public opinion for this project. Um, I do appreciate the way that you present evidence and allow the reader to largely build their own interpretations. 
rather than making broad generalizations off of limited data. Do you prefer working with hard scientific facts or more subjective historic data? Both. <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have to say I really like the intersection of, of both, both forms of data. Yeah. Is it the challenge? Helpful. Is it the challenge that you're drawn to? Yeah, I guess so. And I just find it so much more interesting and, and, and you know, where you've, where the sort of hard science butts against the, mm. the, the sort of public reception of that science or the response to it, the media response to things. I think that that's incredibly interesting. And it's probably the reason that I sort of spent so much time going down the rabbit hole of exploring this topic. Mm. Well, it definitely makes for an interesting read. I never thought I would find <laughs> reading so much. <laughs> Data, scientific data is so interesting, but it definitely keeps it captivating. <laughs> cool, thank you. I'll, I'll let you get back to your busy life and projects, and thank you so much for joining us today. I feel like I've learned so much, and if I could go back, I would edit a few of those questions to suit my newfound knowledge. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Kakite.